What's the significance of President Trump's nomination of Amy Coney Barrett to replace Justice Ginsburg? The timing of things just quite amazing, as I was just sharing Justice Ginsburg passing away at the beginning of Rosh Hashanah, so with the trumpet blast, the, the, the beginning of the sacred season, 10 days of awe on the Jewish calendar, uh, as this return event is, is culminating in D.C., Saturday the 26th, shofars blasted, call for repentance. Literally at that moment, President Trump is announcing the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett. And what I've already tweeted, for all of my non-Catholic friends, I'm not Catholic myself, just understand the attacks that come against her faith in the days ahead are not specifically attacks on her Catholicism, but the attacks on her Christianity and conservative beliefs. Uh, I'm joined on the air by my old friend, Reverend Pat Mahoney. Uh, he is the director of the Christian Defense League, uh, Defense Coalition, and he has been for decades, decades on the front lines of the pro-life movement. Hey, Pat, thanks for joining us on the broadcast today. Uh, thank you for having me, Dr. Brown. And good word, old friend. I, I like that part. Um, I'm actually, for your listeners, I tried to do it outside, but I'm in the office literally across the street from the Supreme Court. I could throw a stone and hit the court. It's a bit windy outside. But Dr. Brown, it's on Saturday, my heart was so full of God's thankfulness and glory and I just thought it gets wearisome sometimes, uh, especially on the life issue, on the pro-life call. And I've been out in 100-degree heat, freezing weather. I prayed at the court by myself and with crowds. And sometimes you continue to pray. You see setbacks in the court. You see other struggles. And I felt, and I, I think every person is a little bit different, but they can all understand this, that God literally imprinted a verse in my spirit, grow not weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap a harvest if you, faint, if you faint not. And Mike, I thought for 47 years we've been praying at this court for this moment, mm. and it's here. Mm. This moment is here now. All the people who came up here that no one will ever know until we get into heaven, all the people who have sacrificed, all the people who have gotten up at 1 and 2 in the morning and cried out to God and fasted and prayed. Brothers and sisters, this is that moment. And to confirm it, and to just show we're not speaking in hyperbole, look at what happened. No one knew this announcement was going to be made on the 26th. No one knew Justice Ginsburg would pass. And here we have major Christian events yeah. going on that day people on the mall repenting and crying out to God, people seeking revival. And Mike, you and I agree that when the Holy Spirit moves, it's just not an internal spiritual thing. Of course, that is the foundation. But our faith and our commitment to Christ springs out into the public square, into the community. So it's just exciting. And I, I love what you said. Everyone has to realize when they attack Judge Barrett, and they're already doing it, it's not an attack just on her faith or her experience or her journey. It's an attack on ours. And I think one of the sidebars since BLM began is God has pulled a curtain back where we see how public expressions of faith, particularly Christianity, are now being treated in a very troubling way, are being restricted, are being censored, are being uh, treated differently than other forms of demonstration. For example, here in D.C., um, early on, months ago, I could not gather more than 10 people at the Capitol to pray, and yet the city was allowing tens of thousands of people to demonstrate. Students were arrested for sidewalk chalking in front of Planned Parenthood. And if you walked out in front of the court today, there's chalk all over. So there's a lot, you know, you know what I love about the Lord? He's so amazing. When he moves in one way, it's like a stone in a pond. It ripples out into so many other areas. And God is doing this extraordinary moment. And if you will, pulling back the curtain and let us 
and letting the church really see what's going on in America regarding public expressions of faith and how mm. they feel about Christianity. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the truth on so many levels. And Pat, you know, Jonathan Kahn and I were talking early evening Saturday uh, about, okay, the timing of Justice Ginsburg's death. You couldn't be a, a time of the year, especially as a Jewish person, that gets your attention more. And the shofar had already been sounded in different parts of the world when we hear the news of her passing. And then these events, the prayer event with Franklin Graham and the return, these were scheduled months in advance. No one knew any of this yes. was coming. And the schedule for the return, I, I got it weeks back, very detailed, laid out. And it was going to end right coming to 5 p.m. with the sounding of the shofar. And then in the evening, we'd continue with celebration and, and a focus on Israel and things. So, I mean, the shofar is being blasted, right? I mean, literally within seconds or minutes of the announcement of Amy Coney Barrett. So, so Pat, you're a realist. I mean, you've been arrested many times for pro-life activity. You, you bear in the front lines, like you said, 47 years. It's easy to get weary during that time. You know that people can surprise us. Anthony Kennedy ends up going, the, you know, a Reagan appointee, going the wrong way in key decisions. John Roberts, a Bush appointee, wrong way. We've already seen Gorsuch go the wrong way. And he's a Trump appointee. Uh, yet you feel now with, with Amy Barrett that this, this really is a tipping point. Why is this so significant? Why is she so significant? And why is the composition of the court something that you really think could make the difference you've been praying for for almost 50 years? Well, let's talk about Dr. Barrett herself. Just look at her writings. Look at her. Let's start, Mike, where we should start with every politician. And that's not with their votes. Let's start with their personal life. The mother of seven, two children from Haiti, one special need child, balancing out the role of law professor, mother, wife, her complete devotion to her faith, which she has been very open about. I'm not going to criticize Justice Gorsuch or Justice Kennedy, but there is no narrative whatsoever in their lives that connects them to a deep-seated, real faith. As a matter of fact, one of the things that, that brings assurance, and I think should reassure everyone across the country who might be a little bit nervous, is how progressives are attacking her faith. Yep. The uh, only other justices who had that kind of faith uh, narrative and journey recently, Scalia, and Thomas, mm. and I think they turned out pretty well. Yep. So, so you look first at a personal life. That's where everybody has to begin, and uh, none of the other justices that you refer to had that. Second, she's left a, a wide variety of opinion and views in regard to being a law professor. So nothing's going to take us by surprise. Nothing is going to be out there that she hasn't indicated over a long journey of teaching at uh, Notre Dame Law School. Then, for the time, and it hasn't been that long, when she was on the federal bench, look at her opinions. So I do feel that, that way. But Mike, there, there's something, um, I know I'm Presbyterian, you and I always joke about that, although you know, God did sovereignly put all this stuff together before it happened. But anyway, that's for another radio show altogether. But she is almost, in a way, the mere image of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Yeah. She had children when she was a student. She was a mom. She was a law professor. She argues for the marginalized and disenfranchised. In many ways, she is a Ruth Bader Ginsburg on so many uh, platforms. So it's kind of interesting that if she replaces Ruth Bader Ginsburg, it will be a woman that Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I think, would have been proud of. Uh, this, this woman who exemplifies in her life the whole mantra of being pro-choice is a lie. You don't have to have abortion to get ahead. Being pregnant won't uh, hurt your career. I mean, <laughs> seven children, and she will assume outside of the presidency, and some people might even argue greater than the presidency because it's lifetime, but one of the highest positions in the world. And so 
these are the things. And then finally, it's interesting, and this is maybe inside D.C., but when the opening for Justice Kavanaugh, uh, when uh, Justice Scalia passed, there was an internal serious discussion among evangelicals and charismatics who did not feel comfortable with Kavanaugh. And all of them were leaning toward Amy Coney Barrett, and they felt the president missed his mark. And people said, no, there will be a time, just like Esther, where uh, God will raise this woman up for such a time as this. And in all honesty, if she were nominated before, she might have not gotten confirmed. But right now, President Trump, given the political climate, and this is a political decision, let's be honest, he had to nominate a woman. And what better woman than than uh, Judge Barrett? So I look at things first from a spiritual perspective, not a political perspective. We see the hand of God so much into this and the Holy Spirit moving. And um, I was working with police officers. They expected 20 to 30,000 for the combined event of the return and the D.C. prayer march. And it exceeded that by multiple times. Was it 75,000, 100,000? We don't know. But all the press said so many more people came than expected. I see this gray crying out to God. Those people um, at, at the two events were not there at a Trump rally. They were not there at a Republican rally. They were called as the people of God to seek the Holy Spirit in repentance and brokenness and say, God, heal our land, move in our land, touch our hearts. And that's what this race is really all about. We bring it to God. We look to God and we seek him. And, and I do know this. And you're, a, you know, I don't even remotely consider myself a theologian. I know you are. But I do know that when God brings judgment he brings ample warning. He isn't like a parent who will suddenly ground you for six months. Without yeah, and, and hey, just to jump in, because we're out of time, Pat. Yes, it's a warning. The warning is here. The shaking is here. The window of mercy is open. We've got to seize the moment. Pat, thank you. It is time. God bless.